Coming up on Chasing the Natty, I hope you all had a wonderful Easter weekend with your loved ones. In the spirit of the holiday, I'm going to be discussing some players whose CFF careers are in need of a resurrection. We'll take a deep dive into some of last year's biggest disappointments and what kind of path they'll need to take in order to get back to CFF relevance this year. After that, stick around for more spring news and notes from around the country, some of which can help you find some really, really good values late in your drafts. We've got all that and more coming right after this. This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everyone. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chasing the Natty podcast. I hope you guys are having a wonderful ride to your work on this Tuesday morning. We are the College Fantasy Football Podcast on the Campus of Canton Podcast Network. You can find us of all your podcast feeds and on YouTube every Monday morning during the offseason at 6 a.m. sharp. If you want to support the great work we're doing here, head on over to CampusCanton.com and subscribe there with one of our sensational tiers. You'll find everything you need for your CFF, Devi, C2C, IDP, betting needs. Pretty much we got everything over there. We got rankings, articles, tools, and even more than that. You can also find me and the show on Twitter. I'm at CFF underscore Jared. And the show is at Chasing of the Natty. And unfortunately, there is no handsome faces across from me today to introduce to you guys. We are going solo this week. Again, it is Easter weekend. I hope you guys enjoyed your weekend with your families. If you do celebrate and if you don't celebrate, well, hope you had a great weekend regardless. Um, but I didn't want to bother anybody else with trying to record a show this weekend. Again, lots of lots of family gatherings and stuff like that. So just figured it made the most sense to record probably what's likely going to be a shorter episode. Knowing my long-winded nature, it's probably going to be a regular length show regardless. But again, just a quick little show here. Again, we're, we're releasing this a day late. Again, just didn't have time over the Easter weekend in order to get this show out and everything initially i planned on it but then again sunday just got absolutely crazy for me so i'm not going to bore you guys with all of that again we got a great show here for you guys today a topic that i've been kind of looking at the last couple of weeks um but i've been kind of waiting for a good weekend to bring it up and this weekend made a lot of sense in my mind as again we're still not getting a ton of scrimmage news believe it or not from around the country still um and spring games are still about a week or so away so i figured this is about time again a little tongue-in-cheek you know resurrection sunday resurrecting some cff players careers it'd be fun to talk about some guys who are kind of coming out of value in drafts right now that technically have a path to recuperate the cff value that we thought they had going into last year right so the CFF community did a really good job last year in terms of finding guys. We really didn't have a ton of busts last year. Or if we did, a lot of them have graduated, moved on. Like I think Frank Harris kind of kind of deal where we drafted him really high. It didn't work out, but you know, he's out of eligibility, so it doesn't matter. There's actually really not a lot of guys that you know busted on us last year and then came back. But I was able to go in and find six guys that I think we could talk about. Um, I'm not, today's topic is not me going to sit there and say every one of these guys will become a CFF value. Clearly every single one of these guys has very clear reasons why they're going much later in drafts this year than they did last year. But it is always fun to talk about those kind of values that you can find. So again, we got six of those players. I got some news and notes from around different camps and stuff. So I say we go ahead and dive right on into this as best we can. As soon as I get myself ready here, there we go. I've got my notes ready to go. And let's talk about those bounce back players after a few quick announcements. You guys know how I roll. 
first little announcement again campusacan.com we got our freshman guide out there this is a must-have for any c2c or cff dynasty player great breakdowns of all of the freshmen out there they're coming into coming into universities this year it has been really a much better um much better tool to use than just simply going on to 247 on three rivals and just using their rankings because their rankings are great don't get me wrong but we are specifically looking for guys that are going to have instant CFF, C to C impact. So this is the guide for you if you're looking for that. Go check that out. And I don't have a graphic for it, but Campus Ken is also getting ready to release their rookie guide over the next week, just in time for the NFL draft at the end of this month. Quite frankly, guys, if you're in a rookie draft, there's no group better to go listen to their takes on than people who have been watching these guys quite literally since they were in junior varsity in high school sometimes. Shoot, I'm pretty sure part of our recruiting team is like staking out hospitals waiting for newborns to come out and they're already scouting these guys. Like that's how crazy we get and how long we've been looking at these guys. So I would trust our opinion a little bit when it came to rookie guides. So definitely be on the lookout for that over the next week there. Other announcement is absolutely go check out the latest episode of Defending the Natty with myself and Nate Marquise. Again, we discussed some early offseason. Sh- e- oh my goodness. Early offseason trading and some initial CFF Dynasty rankings. This next month, which will be released on the 15th, we are going to be discussing some freshmen. Uh, Nate is putting together a great show for that. So be on the lookout for that if you're in any kind of CFF dynasty or really keeper league or just C2C league if you want to win your college side pretty consistently. So be on the lookout for that. Again, enough of those announcements. Let's get on into some of these bounce back players. We'll start with quarterbacks. I got three quarterbacks, two running backs, and one wide receiver we'll be discussing today. And like I said before, again, a lot of this was really hard. I initially didn't want to do guys that got injured last year because I'm like, ah, that feels a little bit too easy. But really, there's so many, or there's a very few guys that really fit into the criteria of like complete bust last year that was healthy the whole season and came back this year. Again, CFF community, we did a pretty solid job last year. Um, a couple of honorable mentions I do want to throw out here, mostly because on um, one hand, I have talked about two of these guys pretty recently on the show, so I don't want to sound too repetitive, and that's Mario Williams and Chandler Morris. Mario Williams, obviously going from USC to Tulane. I've talked about how much I think that Mario could do really well at Tulane with John Sumrall system over there. And then the other one, Chandler Morris, we talked about his potential impact there at North Texas and the system that Eric Morris has been able to put up, put up over there. I am, again, I'm not going to go too much into depth on that again. And then two other honorable mentions I want to throw out here, and this is really just an extended shout out of the CFF All Access podcast over there at Fantasy Points hosted by Josh Chevalier. I was initially going to talk about Grayson McCall and Malik Benson, but and those are two guys that they discussed on their podcast recently this past week. And quite frankly, a lot of the stuff that they said about uh, Benson and McCall were going to be stuff that I would have talked about here. So I'm just going to say go listen to their podcast because one, they do a really good job. But two, they break down Malik Benson and Grace McCall really, really well and will pretty much be an extension of what we're talking about here. So with those honorable mentions out of the way, let's talk about the first quarterback here. If you're watching this on YouTube, you've seen him up on the screen for a while now. Tyler Shuck. Quarterback going to Louisville, formerly of Texas Tech, formerly of Oregon. Last year, people were ready to finally get Tyler Shuck, the Zach Kitley quarterback, right? QB 12 off the board last year, end of the fifth round. Very much disappointing performance after he gets injured after really three and a half games. Again, he barely made it into the fourth week before getting injured. And with his total points finished as QB 138, but he was off to a pretty solid start. Again, 29.12 fantasy points in week one, 39.38. Then it followed that up with a 14.92 fantasy point week in week three. So clearly a little bit up and down there, but very much off to a pretty hot streak. QB 18 through week three. But like I said, he gets injured. He's out for pretty much the rest of the season there. And after the season... 
I guess, again, Baron Morton, the staff just wants somebody consistent there. They don't want to deal with the injuries anymore. Shuck is out. Shuck transfers over to Louisville, where Jeff Brom is in need of a new quarterback with Jack Plummer out of eligibility and Hayden O'Connell being out of eligibility last year. He can't rely on either of those two guys anymore. And seems like for some reason, Jeff Brom can't get any of the five backup quarterbacks he had behind Plummer last year really to take that next step. So he goes out and he grabs Tyler Shuck here. And really this all boils down to that. Like Shuck has some really, really high upside because of his dual threat nature and in the systems that he plays in the biggest problem has been his health. Like, this is kind of later in my notes, but like this health issue is massive, right? Four games in 2021, seven games in 2022, four games in 2023. It's like he's not played a full season in four years. So that's clearly why his value has dropped here, right? He is currently going as QB 43 in drafts right now. You can get him around the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th round. And quite frankly, again, like, if you're looking at where Brahms QBs have been finishing the last couple of years, they've been finishing in that QB 50, QB 60 range. So you're kind of thinking to yourself like, okay, that's where Plummer and O'Connell have been finishing the last two years. Like then Shuck should be right at the value that he needs, right? Well, the major difference between Shuck and Plummer in, in uh, AOC is that both AOC and Plummer are decidedly not dual threat. Like, Plummer can run a little bit, but you're not asking him to get more than an average of one yard per game there. Um, meanwhile, Shuck, much more dual threat than either of those two have ever been. He has averaged, I didn't realize this, but he's averaged 11 carries a game over the last two years. Now, granted, that's 11 games total because of just how injured he's been but regardless like that's still an impressive number of carries for a guy that i don't think a lot of people think of off the top of their head as tyler shuck dual threat qb like looking at 2022 right if you take what he was able to do in his first seven games he was on pace for 461 yards on the ground and seven touchdowns in 2023 again limited sample size in four games but he was on pace for 447 yards and six touchdowns again pretty consistent there so he averaged 440 454 yards and six touchdowns on the ground if you extrapolate his last two years to 12 games. So, again, when you consider that Plummer is basically a zero in rushing, we take that AOC is basically a zero in rushing. Let's add in this 454 yards and six touchdowns average that Shuck was looking at the last two years. And we'll take it, we'll even take it away from the passing. We'll assume that, all right, for every yard that he rushes, instead, he, that's a yard that he couldn't get through passing. Cool. Let's just assume that. So, doing the math here, we, we went to Plummer. Plummer got 215.48 fantasy points last year. Let's take away those 454. Passing yards, we add 454 rushing yards to his fantasy point total. And then we add six rushing touchdowns there. That would bring him to a total that would have been good for QB 25 last year. So, again, this really goes back to that if Shuck can stay healthy, he can be a really, really solid quarterback for CFF this next upcoming year. And unfortunately... That's just going to be the price that gets baked in. You draft him as QB 43. You get him as your fourth quarterback off the board. You're probably feeling excellent if he's actually able to stay healthy. If you get four weeks in and he's hurt again, you're just sitting there scratching your head, wondering why you ever trusted a guy that hasn't played more than seven games the last three years. It's, Unfortunately, the nature of the beast right now, and especially when it comes to evaluating these bounce back candidates that are heavily, and I repeat, heavily dependent on injuries. So we'll see. I think Shuck's a great value right now. Again, if you get him as your fourth quarterback off the board, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Um, I got him as my QB 33. I So again, him, him going in the 16th round, I've got my fair share of Shuck here and there. All right. Next quarterback here. What's about Curtis Rourke? Again, I've talked about the Indiana situation before, so I'll try to be relatively brief here, but Rourke's definitely hit quite the value drop. 
uh, since last year. Last year, he was being drafted as the QB 19, uh, beginning of the beginning of the eighth round, end of the seventh. Probably saw him a few drafts go as high as the six. Ended up finishing QB 80. Really, it came down to the fact that he really was not the same after his injury at the end of 2022. Um, in 2023, he only had two games that were above 20 fantasy points, which if you compare that to 2022, where he finished as QB 22, so again, big drop from 2022 to 2023. In 2022, he had seven games above 20 points, four of which were above 30 points. He did not have a 30-point game in 2022, just to give you an idea of how limited he was that next year. Very big, big disappointment. That whole... Ohio Bobcat offense was a big disappointment. Again, if you had say Ben Guerra, you know exactly who I'm talking about. But he's done at Ohio. Again, I don't know if it's because he feels like his ceiling is limited there now. But he is heading over to Indiana and Kurt Signetti. And we have talked about at length before how wonderful Kirk Signetti's quarterbacks have been for CFF the last couple of years. In 2023, just this past year, Jordan McLeod, QB6. 28.64 points per game. In 2022, you had Todd Santeo finish as QB 19. He had he also had a right at the same 28.68 fantasy points per game. Reason why I didn't finish higher in the rankings because he missed a game or two, I believe. Uh, yeah, he missed two games, I believe, that year. So he probably, if he played all 12 games, would have finished as a top seven quarterback as well. Signetti at James Madison was a cff qb darling the major major problem here that blocks rourke from becoming the next great signetti quarterback is just the idea of indiana in the big big i almost said big 12 indiana in the big 10 right if rourke was going to james madison he would be a top six top five quarterback off the board he's a guy we've liked in the past two years removed from the injury you would be feeling really great here's the problem the schedules matter and this matters on two different levels one Rourke is making a big jump in competition here. He's going from the Ohio Bobcat schedule in the MAC going up to Indiana's schedule. So if we look at in at Ohio's schedule in 2023, and I go so I I whenever I'm trying to compare defenses, a lot of times I will go to Nicholas Ian Allen CFB winning edge um, data from last year and compare the team defensive performance numbers. And kind of use that to build up a strength of schedule of sorts because that measures how well how well those defenses are actually performing against the competition that they are facing. And it's a really, really good net um, value to compare things. So Rourke's schedule last year averaged 81.54. Again, it's a score out of 100. So all the teams on the schedule average 81.54. Indiana's 2024 schedule averages 86.61 that is a jump of over five points and considering that most teams find themselves between 95 and 80 to go for to go up five points is basically a 33 percent increase in competition level that's concerning and then there's also the system right because Kirk Sinetti's offense has torn up the Sun Belt the last two years James Madison's 2023 schedule averaged 82.24 points. So again, that's another four-point jump there in in schedule right there. So very much that's the big roadblock there, right? And that's why Curtis Rourke has dropped in ADP value. It's not just because of the injury. He's currently going as QB 43, or excuse me, not QB 43. I, I just realized I wrote down the same ADP for both. Tyler Shuck and for um as well as Kurt Curtis Rourke. Let me look that up real quick. Alright, let's see what we got here. Let me find Rourke. Where is Rourke? Ah, Rourke's going outside the top twenty rounds. So he's taking a massive, massive, <coughs> massive job since last year so 
clearly the the price has been baked in here. If you're going after Rourke, you are taking the upside shot on him. You're getting him as a QB four, five, six, seven, honestly, in some drafts. And you've baked in this risk right here, right? So really the path to Rourke getting the bounce back here is that Signetti's system is just that good. That doesn't matter that Indiana is going up against the schedule, including the likes of Ohio State, Michigan, uh, UCLA's, um, again, they got they lost a lot on defense this past year, but they should still have a lot of talent on that defense right there. So it's a schedule that includes four, point, four teams last year that had 90-plus points in that team defensive performance rating that I was talking about compared to the previous season where both Rourke and James Madison only faced one team with 90-plus points in that stat category. So, yeah. you Basically, again, the path to that is Signetti system is just that good. Rourke, two years removed from the injury, starts looking like his old self. The weapons click, and Indiana's got plenty of weapons right now. I'm not sure that I'm at the point where all of this makes me makes it worth drafting Rourke. Again, he's going late enough that I probably will have a couple shares of him at some point this year. Because at first, he when, when the offseason first started going on, he was getting drafted pretty decently highly. I think a lot of people come around to the idea that, well, we got to be careful with this Big Ten schedule. So, Curtis Rourke, that's his path back to relevance this year. We'll see if it happens again. Unfortunately, with a lot of these bounce-back candidates, there's just so, so much unknown. Probably the quarterback that I am the most convinced will have a solid bounce-back this year is the next guy we're going to talk about here. And that is Tyler Van Dyke, former quarterback out of Miami, now the quarterback at Wisconsin. He, of the three quarterbacks, probably was the one that was going the latest last year. Again, QB 42, 16th round. I saw him going higher at times last year, but again, by the time the end of the season came around, people were kind of coming off of him. Finished QB 66, um, played 11 games, hindered for three of them, so he probably could have finished higher than QB 66. Because three of his first six games were 25 plus points before he got nicked up and injured. So, and you can see this reflected in the ADP this year, right? He's QB 54, round 19. So not nearly as big of a drop as the other guys here. But, 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 like I said, I think I'm the most convinced that Tyler Van Dyke is going to have the solid bounce back and become CFF relevant this year. I'm pretty pretty high on him. I don't know where I have him in my rankings off the top of my head. I probably should have written that down. Um but really again, we've seen we've seen Phil Longo do really well with quarterbacks. Obviously this past year Tanner Mordecai was on pace at one point for QB 55, but really just <sighs> Mordecai by the end of it was just a bad quarterback and I think that Wisconsin was heavily hindered by him. I think Tyler Van Dyke is a much better quarterback, should be an upgrade for that system. We saw what Phil Long was able to do with Drake May and Sam Howell. You're talking about top 10 CFF finishes there. The big problem, though, is that Tyler Van Dyke is a near zero in the rushing department. So that got me wondering, like, if Drake May and Sam Howell only had their regular season passing numbers, where would literally, like, just completely remove all of their rushing where would they have finished in their respective years? And so I went back to 2020, where Sam Howell did play in 12 games, so this actually made the analysis pretty easy. He would have thrown for 3,586 yards, 30 touchdowns. That would have been good for 263.44 fantasy points. Last year, that would have finished as QB 29, so solid. 2021's a, the one that's a little bit worrying. You got Sam Howell again that year. Uh, threw for 3,056 yards in the regular season, 24 touchdowns. That would have been only good for um, 210.24 fantasy points, QB 59. That pretty much puts Dyke right back where he normally is. That we don't like. But then in 2022, Drake May's final season with Phil Longo, 3,847 regular season passing yards, 35 touchdowns. That would have been good for 293.88 fantasy points and good for QB 19. So Dyke, just because of his rushing ability, is not going to be able to you know, hit the highs that May and Howell were able to 
in their best years with Phil Longo, but there is absolutely a path with just the passing here for Dyke to have a solid, solid path to a very consistent QB for CFF moving forward here. Again, if he can finish in that QB 19 to QB 29 range just on the passing right there, there you go. That's 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 Van Dyke potentially becoming a value in drafts right there. So very high floor guy. Don't think I'm necessarily going to take him as a or I don't think you can take him as a ceiling guy. But that's that to me is the path for Van Dyke to make it back to relevance this year. Especially again, we've seen a lot of teams where year two with their head coach, year two with their offensive coordinator is a pretty big step. Now, granted, they typically have the same quarterback, but Van Dyke, I trust to be talented enough to be able to pick up the system pretty decently. All right. Let's look at our next player here. We'll talk about Jaquindon Jackson, the running back out of Arkansas, formerly of Utah. Last year, we were drafting him as the RB12, end of the third round. We thought we had our next, next, next great Utah, Kyle Whittingham, Alexander Ludwig uh, running back here. And that is straight up not what we got. He he led the team in rushing and still finished as RB 122. The entire Arkansas backfield was a mess. The entire Arkansas team was a mess last year. I really thought I really think that they were hoping Rising would be available at one point that year. None of the backup quarterbacks were able really to do much. And so that mess basically leads to Jackson saying, like, all right, I'm out of here. Like, I'm not dealing with this anymore. He goes to Arkansas with Sam Pittman, Bobby, Bobby Petrino over there. And with that, we obviously see a big drop in ADP compared to last year. Was RB12, now RB70. A guy you can get around the end of the 14th, beginning of the 15th round. So clearly still drafted in pretty much every draft that we do. But we, we all know that two years ago, Raheem Sanders was an absolute monster for CFF. And Sam Pittman's still around. So it's wondering one of these things of, will Jackson at Arkansas be like last year at Arkansas, where it's full committee, Raheem Sanders was nicked up, you had A.J. Green, you had Rashad DeBinion, you had Isaiah Agastave getting involved in there, and it was a complete mess of a backfield. Nobody in CFF really wanted to touch it. Or... Is it like two years ago when Raheem Sanders was that top dog and everybody was loving it? Unfortunately, again, we're evaluating guys that people on the surface could look at and say, oh, there's probably a big bounce back here and everything like that. And again, speaking of Arkansas running backs, I probably could have done a segment on Raheem Sanders here as well. But with Jackson, I really think it's going to end up being more like last year. Uh, in addition to the fact that Rashad DeBinion and Isaiah Agasave are returning, two guys that the staff really do want to get out there more. Petrino, Bobby Petrino, just in his history, in his history, loves to split the workload between players. It also really doesn't help that Taylor Green is probably going to be allowed to run a lot more than KJ Jefferson was able to last year. So that's another rushing threat that's going to be added to the mix here. I really just don't see the path to Jaquindon Jackson unless he just completely starts blowing out these practices. And if you read the Arkansas practice reports, that's just not the vibe we're getting from right now. So as much as I would like to see a Jaquindon Jackson bounce back this next year, and maybe down the line he does, but I just don't see it this year. All right, one another running back that we'll talk about here is a guy that go, went right ahead of Jaquin and Jackson in drafts last year, and that is Kavorian Barnes, the running back out of UTSA, a guy we loved coming out of his redshirt freshman year, where he had some really, really solid, um, has a really, really solid finish at the end of 2022. It really made it seem like it was going to be Barnes's backfield to own at UTSA when he had 28 carries versus North Texas, when he had 22 carries versus Troy the very, or not the very next week, but two weeks later in the bowl game. But that's just, again, not what we ended up having last year. Again, uh, Robert Henry gets involved. Um, Griffin gets involved as well. 
And for a guy like Barnes who gets drafted at RB11, end of the third round last year, finishes his RB108 on the year. Now, granted, he did miss two games in weeks 11 and 12, so you probably bump that up a little bit higher to around like RB80 in terms of if he had played all 12 games. But regardless, just not what we were expecting last year. And I think there's a couple of things here. And I do see a path to Barnes returning to be CFF relevant this year again. And it, it involves it involves several things here, right? So first and foremost... Barnes, in my opinion, got screwed on the touchdown opportunities last year, especially for a 220-pound back. Robert Henry was a touchdown machine last year. He had 11 touchdowns to Barnes' six, despite having, oh God, how many was it? Seven, like 30, 30 less carries than Barnes. He had five more touchdowns. It was just an insane insane touchdown rate so like utsa's running back scored 23 touchdowns on 365 carries last year that's a touchdown rate of 6.3 percent henry had a 6.8 percent touchdown rate while barnes only had a 4.1 percent touchdown rate so that really was quite quite unfortunate so I think that we see that level out a little bit this year. Like, you're not going to see Barnes only score six touchdowns again this year. In fact, if you take Barnes, you make him play 12 games at the pace that he was going at, he would have finished the 12 game regular season with 160, or excuse me, 176 carries and 864 yards. And then if you apply that touchdown rate based on that number of carries, you would have been looking at 11 touchdowns. Add all that together, you get an RB62. So still not quite there when it comes to getting to CFF relevance. But one other thing I wanted to try here was if you return his explosiveness to two seasons ago. So last year, Barnes had a bit of a slowdown. Again, got nicked up. Finished the year with 4.9 yards per carry versus his redshirt freshman year he was popping off at 6.3 yards per carry. So let's assume he does get back to that 6.3 yards per pop and keeps that 11 touchdowns. You would get 1,108 yards, and that would put him at RP44. So to me, that puts him right at the cusp of being relevant again. Now, of course, it's super clear. There's a lot of best-case scenarios there, right? Him getting back to over six yards per carry. That's not exactly always something you can assume out of running backs, right? This assumes that Robert Henry doesn't get every goal line touch again. Um, or you're hoping that Barnes gets more opportunities and they um, along the goal line in, in terms of touchdown luck. There's no guarantee that the staff is going to not move away from Henry getting a lot more touchdowns again. But assuming that these things were just happenstance and that there will be some regression to the mean on some of these things... Barnes has a pretty solid case, and if and if Robert Henry goes down at any point, Barnes absolutely goes back to right right back to being relevant, and it's 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 a risk I'm willing to take given where his current ADP is. Again, we're talking about a guy that went RB11 last year. We like this guy. We like the situation at UTSA. This is a head coach and Jeff Trailer who has love to do top or um, bell cow running backs that as long as they're not nicked up and Barnes is currently going as RB 90 in drafts. You're talking about the end of the 19th round guys. I'll take that shot. Yeah. There's a lot of things that need to go right for him to get back to where we thought he was going to be clearly. Like even when I do best case scenario, you're probably still not getting to RB 11 range, but you know, for a guy that we like so much, like RB 90, you're talking about like my eighth running back off the board. Yeah, shoot, I'll take that shot. All right, last player we'll talk about here in terms of bounce back candidates is Dorian Singer, the wide receiver out of Utah, formerly of USC, formerly of Arizona. This dude loves himself some Pac-12 action. Last year, he was one of my least favorite values. I did not like where he's going. He was at wide receiver 18, uh, beginning of the fifth round there. I, again, I was vindicated in the fact that he really just did not get onto the field as much with USC. I think it was a mistake to assume he would be the wide receiver one. In fact, 
he might have been one of the biggest busts last year. He finished as wide receiver 426 last year. So it was a rough, rough year for Singer. Clearly why he wanted to get out of USC, start new. And again, going back to somewhere where he can be the top dog again. Like back when he was at Arizona, he finished as a wide receiver 24. Last year, of course, again, gets hit with a big dose of reality. Now he's at Utah, and his ADP is in round 20 plus. So the question to me is, like, if we're going to call this a bounce back campaign for Dorian Singer, how do we get him back to where he was? Well, the good news is that with Utah, that some big heavy hitters are gone. Devon Vele is graduating. Mikey Matthews, the true freshman they had last year, super talented guy. He is out transferring to Cal to become apparently second or third string over there. Not not sure what his thought process is there. Really the only big threat in the receiving game that returns is Money Parks, who's a good receiver in his own right, but reports have been really good so far in camp. I think we touched on this a couple weeks ago that Singer and Rising are connecting really, really well. And that's all great to hear. That's a good start. Here's the major, major problem. Utah might be worse than Georgia when it comes to producing CFF-relevant wide receivers. So to give you an idea, over the last three years, the top wide receiver at Utah has finished wide receiver 169, wide receiver 129, and wide receiver 168. To give you an idea, here's Georgia's top wide receiver finishes. Wide receiver 173, wide receiver 89, and wide receiver 195. So you're talking about like pretty much right in that range, the kind of wide receiver numbers that makes Nate Marquise uh, throw up. And going back through Kyle Winningham's history at Utah, which the good news is there's a lot of history for us to look for with Kyle Winningham there at Utah. The highest number of passing attempts we've seen there is 365, which is not a crazy number by any means. And the highest number of targets we have seen a Kyle Whittingham wide receiver get at Utah was Darren Carrington II in 2017 with 91 targets. So that's not great in general. You guys know my rule of thumb when it comes to CFF wide receivers. If you can find me a path to 100 targets, then I consider it a really good CFF pick there. And so that really became my mission here. If we're going to call this a Dorian Singer bounce back campaign, what can I expect here? Because when he was at Arizona, he was able to finish wide receiver 24 on just a little under 100 targets. So I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, can he do it again here? Well, to me, you got to stretch here. You got to you gotta make Kyle Whittingham do some things he hasn't done before. Like the fact that, okay, maybe the backfield's kind of a mess this year, right? You got Jalen Glover. You got Michael Bernard still. You got the FCS transfer, uh, Anthony Woods coming in. None of those guys have ever really taken over that backfield, become a guy that Kyle Whittingham can rely on. So maybe with Cam Rising back in his seventh year, veteran quarterback, he's willing to pass it more. Let's go crazy. Again, his highest number of a passing attempts he's allowed a quarterback is 365. Let's get Rising to 400, which is 33 pass attempts per game, by the way. So to give you an idea of like how crazy we're going here. And even then... Let's go to a 25% target share for Singer. That, and that's pretty much the top cusp of what we can expect out of Kyle Whittingham wide receiver because that's what Darian Carrington got in 2017, which is right at 90, like right at 25%. So 400 pass attempts. Then that's when you barely get to that 100 target threshold that I like. So even in this best case scenario where I'm like stretching what Kyle Woodingham typically does and coming up with narrative-based things here. We're still barely getting to where I like a Dorian Singer comeback this year. So in conclusion, I don't quite fully see the bounce back for Singer. So, but again, that's kind of the path to it. And that's the likely, and again, today wasn't really about me naming a ton of guys again guys like tyler van dyke i think will bounce back well i think kavorian barnes has a path to get there tyler shuck i think could bounce back as long as he stays healthy 
But again, these are all guys that people have been talking about. It's like, oh, can they bounce back this year? And so I kind of took the path and evaluated, like, how likely are they going to be able to get to a place where they could be CFF relevant again? And some guys are good. Some guys are not. So we'll see. All right. With that being said, that's enough about some bounce back candidates. Let's run through some of this um, spring camp news that we have been getting here. And I think we can start with a guy that we have been really kind of questioning what the heck's going on with him. And that's Rashad Amos. This is a guy that I've, I've seen a lot of people draft him in CFF best balls, you know, hoping he just hoping, praying he lands somewhere good. Or some people are hoping he goes back to Miami of Ohio. I could tell you based on this latest report from Chris Hummer at 247, that is not going to be the case. He has a lot of suitors and he's going to pick one of them. So a couple of interesting things that come out of this article from Chris Hummer. First of all, apparently Rashad Amos was headed to Washington, literally committed the day before DeBoer announced his commitment to Alabama. And uh, myself and Nate Marquise were both a little confused, saying like, well, that never made it public. Apparently he made the commitment to the staff and just it hadn't come out in the public yet. And then when DeBoer announced, he was like, oh, I'm just going to keep that on the down low. We're not going to say that I actually committed to Washington there. Um, and so now he's kind of been in limbo ever since then, because that came right at the end of the transfer portal period. And, you know, now he's deciding to kind of take his time and determine where he's going to go next. So some schools that he named as be- being ones that reached out to him were Ole Miss, Northwestern, Arizona, Washington, again, Michigan State, his NIL representative came in and said Auburn, Kansas State, USC, TCU have reached out as well. I don't believe as much that the ones that the schools like Auburn, Kansas state, USC, TC are the ones that were named by the NIL representative. I don't think those are actually getting involved as much. I think that's just an NIL representative, just, you know, agenting it up and trying to throw out big names like Auburn, USC to show other schools like, Hey, big boys like Auburn and USC are coming in. Um, you better pony up that NIL and everything like that. So I'm more interested in the schools, again, that were named by Amos himself. So like Ole Miss, Northwestern, Arizona, Washington, Michigan State. I think Arizona's probably out of it. I think that was probably something where Arizona reached out before they got Merritt, before they got Conley. They should be pretty good to go unless they want to add a third running back. But um, Northwestern might be interesting there with Camp Porter which by the way, he's somebody that uh, I'm kind of surprised nobody takes as many shots on at the end of drafts. Granted Northwestern's kind of a train wreck, but still Michigan state also makes a lot of sense there with Nathan Carter really being the only running back they have there. So bringing in Amos makes a lot of sense, but an interesting note in this article was that Amos himself said that winning a championship is super important to him. So, like, he won the MAC championship last year. He wants to win a national championship wherever he goes next. And so that really kind of narrows the list down to me in terms of where he's probably going to go. And that, to me, he's looking at either USC or Ole Miss. Or, again, there's a wild card of him following DeBoer to Bama. But I feel like if that was the case, he would have done so already. So, I think Amos is the guy you need to look out for at Ole Miss. Now, again, there's tons of talk about Henry Parrish going to Ole Miss. But also, I find it interesting that Parrish hasn't committed to Ole Miss yet at this point. So maybe, again, maybe Lane Kiffin thought he was going to get Parrish back. Parrish decides to change his mind. Amos, I think, fits right in with going to Ole Miss. That could be an interesting one to follow, even though, you know, again, that would suck for all my Ulysses Bentley shares I've acquired so far this year. But... You know, such is the way of life in CFF. Next spring news thing here. Again, the transfer portal has not officially opened. It won't open for another two weeks, in which case, hold on to your butts. That's going to be absolutely nuts. But K-Ron Adams, the running back out of UMass, has entered the portal. In a side note, Greg DeRosieres, the RB2, also entered the portal pretty soon afterwards. It's pretty clear that whatever they got going on at UMass with the change in offensive coordinator there, they're not, these top two running backs are not happy. Doesn't seem like that they were expecting to do nearly as well this year. So here they are in the portal. The question now becomes, where does K-Ron Adams go? 
Uh, there's a bit of speculation in our CFF chat about him potentially going to Miami because according to Josh Chevy over at CFF All Access, Miami will be looking to add a thousand yard rusher in the portal. They are an absolute mess in terms of their health at the RB position. They're down a man with Henry Parrish leaving. It makes sense for them to go grab a proven commodity. Adams could have been that guy, but, 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 but. Cameron Adams already has a crystal ball on 247, and it has him going to the Ohio State Buckeyes. This is absolute poison to anybody who has been trying to draft Quinchon Jenkins and Travion Henderson. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that Cameron Adams is nearly as talented as those guys, but it just seems more and more true that this is going to end up being in a committee here. And it, to reinforce this, and this is a really, really good catch by uh, Volume Picks on Twitter. He found a quote in the article talking about Ohio State's new running backs coach, which is Oregon's Carlos Lachlan, that, quote, it'll never be a one-man operation with Lachlan leading the way. He's relied upon two or three running backs in both the seasons with the Ducks. 2024 should be no different. Now, this could still be good because, you know, um, Bucky Irving has been good for Oregon the last two years there. So that it's not impossible for the system to still have a top running back that's CFF relevant here. But it's just more reinforcement that I'm personally just at the point. I'm going to stay away from Ohio State's running back room. There's just too many bodies getting filled up in there. Just when we thought that we were safe with Mayan Williams heading out, with Evan Pryor heading out. Lo and behold, here comes uh, Ryan Day adding even more guys with Quinchon Judkins, now potentially K. Ron Adams. We'll see. Next news and note here from around the country in terms of spring camp reports. We talked about the Wazoo wide receiver situation and got an update for you guys. And we also got a little bit of QB news here as well. I'll go for the QB news here. Um, John Batier currently still with the first team reps at QB, looking pretty good. Uh, went 16 of 21 on the first day there. Uh, Zevi Eckhouse ran with the twos, went 11 of 16. So as of right now, there's a clear, there's a clear tier between the two. Definitely makes me feel better about my John Batier. Um, shares in CFF best balls that I've gotten so far. But again, long way to go in spring. Things can change. The wide receivers are where the bigger update is here. Um, with Matir being the number one guy, he's clearly working with the number one wide receivers more. And a quote from the uh, KugFan.com, this is uh, 247's Washington State website, quote, The pads aren't on yet, so you can take it with a grain of salt, but Matir's favorite target was wide receiver Josh Meredith, a fourth year from San Diego. Meredith, quote, was running with the starters in the slot with Chris Hudson on the other side, also in the slot. That was me clarifying there at the end. But we've talked about the system. We talked about Ben Barkable's system and the slot position being the most important piece. I've been drafting Carlos Hernandez, thinking that he can make it into that slot rotation there. But there's a bit of rough news here. In the fact that Carlos Hernandez has been moved to the outside. He's going to be starting opposite of Kyle Williams. Now, obviously, with how much the system passes, he's still going to have great weeks. Kyle Williams will still have great weeks. These are all guys that are going to be fine regardless. But this new name of Josh Meredith, running with running with the starters in the slot, and Matir seems to have some good chemistry with him. That, to me, is a recipe for a great late-round value right now. I've been getting him pretty much if, like, round 20, I'm taking him off the board. And we'll see if he gets even higher there. By guaranteeing a lot of drafts, if you're with people that have not been up-to-date with listening to this podcast or, you know, reading through every spring practice report they can, they have no idea who Josh Meredith is, and you could probably snag an incredible wide receiver at the end of your draft if he is still available. So something to keep an eye on. Again, maybe this shifts as the spring and fall come along here. But as of right now, Meredith could be one of the biggest values in CFF drafts right now. 
All right, we'll continue on. We'll talk a little bit more wide receivers here. We'll go over to Mississippi State. This coming from the Maroon and White Daily here. We have our three starting wide receivers, it looks like, in Kelly Akiari, which we pretty much knew. Kevin Coleman, the transfer from Louisville, the transfer from Jackson State before that. No surprise there. And really one of the few remaining um, veterans from Mike Leash's days, Justin Robinson, is set to... um, is set to start on the other outside position. So you got Kelly A, Justin Robinson on the outside, Kevin Coleman in the slot. We'll see how well this works out for us. Again, Jeff Lebby has been shown to spread the ball around quite a bit. If I have to draft one of these wide receivers, I'm probably going Kevin Coleman because if there has been guys producing well for CFF in Lebby's system, it has been coming out of the slot. So... Coleman's the guy I probably target there. But here's the interesting thing. If you guys want a blast from the past, here you go. Seydou Traore was running with the first team at tight end. If you remember who Seydou Traore is, lat, or not last year, but in 2022, he was the wide receiver tight end hybrid at Arkansas State, finishing the top 10 tight ends for that year. Transferred to Colorado, transferred out of Colorado. Back then, they had the rules that you had to sit again, so he didn't play at all last year. Well, he's back, and he is starting for the Mississippi State Bulldogs here. And he's being undrafted completely. Again, everybody's completely forgotten about him. And this is a very much boomer bust pick here, right? With Lebby the last couple of years, you've had some busts, like Austin Stogner, tight end 123 last year, less than 200 yards, one touchdown. Casey Kelly, two years ago in 2021, 17 catches, 150 yards, one touchdown. That was the best performing tight end for Lebby there. And you're sitting there like, oh, gross. That's I don't want any part of that. I'm not going to touch Traore. Until you remember that in 2022, Braden Willis at Oklahoma was the tight end seven on the year, th- 35 catches, 456 yards, and seven touchdowns. So, given the fact we've seen Traore already be a top end tight end for CFF, now granted that was in the Sun Belt, not the SEC, so clearly different level of competition here, but still, Traore, if he can, if he can fill that role like Braden Willis was able to do for Levy two years ago. Could be an interesting name to stash in the back of your names or in the back of your drafts if you're looking for tight end options. So who knows? We'll keep the tight end talk going here and we'll switch over to Wyoming here where they are just glowing. And I repeat glowing about tight end John Michael Gillenborg. Jay Johnson recently stated in an interview that I'm trying to figure out uh a reason why I wouldn't try to get him referring to John Michael Gillenberg the ball like every couple plays. And again, this interview is coming from uh, 7220sports.com. I uh, just want to cite that real quick. And I don't blame Jay Johnson here, right? Looking at what they returned from last year, it's almost nothing. They lose Wyatt Wyland. They lose Ayer Asante. They're two top wide receivers. They lose Trayton Welch, the other tight end that was out there with John Michael Gillenberg. They lose Ryan Marquez. They lose four of their top five targets from last year. And Wyoming has been known to utilize the tight end well and has been good to us in CFF the last couple of years. And again, the one guy that they're returning in John Michael Gillenborg might be their best receiving option in general. Last year, in terms of yards per reception, he was second on the team among starters. He was first in yards per route run among starters. So my, Wyoming's getting back their best player here. And so if you got a Jay Johnson, wondering if you can get, like how you get the ball to him every couple of plays, you're talking about a guy that could easily get upwards of potentially... 9, 10, 12 opportunities every single game. And that's an insane, insane target number that you can expect for a tight end there. Again, do I think he's going to get that actually? Probably not. But you're talking about a guy looking up his ADP here. Like you're looking at a tight end that is just not going in the top 20 rounds. And if you can get a tight end that's most likely going to lead his team in receptions... I mean, you got to go for it, right? Again, the, the obviously the big problem is Wyoming is, shall we say, the opposite of uh, pass-happy. 
But even still, like anytime you get an opportunity to have a tight end that leads the room in receiving, I'm not going to turn it down in terms of being able to go get him. So, all right. Continuing on here, let's go look at East Carolina here. This comes to us from Hoist the Colors, uh, the 247 sports site for East Carolina. And the big, big news here is who wide receiver one is going to be. I and many others have loved the idea of Chase Soul. He was a true, or not true freshman, redshirt freshman last year. Very, very impressive season. Um, and he's a guy that we you could get pretty decently late in your drafts. He's been rising up boards recently as people's assumed wide receiver one, including my own. But that's not the word we're getting out of camp anymore. We got a new wide receiver one here, and it's a guy that I personally completely forgot about, and that is Winston Wright Jr. According to the article from hoistacolors.com, the most consistent presence of the scrimmage at receiver was Winston Wright Jr. Continuing the quote, quote, he's got to be the leading candidate to lead the team in catches this fall. It's one of those scenarios where you got big fish, small pond. Again, he started off at West Virginia, did well, went to Florida State, didn't do so hot. So now he drops down a level of competition here. I mean, I got to take him for their word right now. Again, if he continues this, like... He's the guy to draft, not Chase Sewell, unfortunately. You give me Sewell and Blake, the other wide receiver, they're making moves. But again, on all these reports, Wright has been the most impressive among the wide receivers. And he's probably the guy that I'm going to take shots on in drafts. And I'll probably avoid Chase Sewell until his value comes down. The other piece of information we'll be getting here is the fact that we should expect much greater, much more improved quarterback play from the East Carolina Pirates. A quote from the article, the biggest difference in this year's offense in the scrimmages is the sheer talent and playmaking ability at quarterback. The amount of accurate balls from both transfer quarterbacks, Katen Hauser and Jake Garcia, and the ability to throw guys wide open is just night and day. And again, me adding this here at the end, compared to last year, right, where Mason Garcia was just an absolute mess. And uh, the other options they had behind him were not much better. Hauser, Garcia, you're bringing in two former blue chip quarterbacks to compete against each other. They're both, it sounds like whichever one gets the job, we should expect a much better offense out of the Pirates this year. And that's really good news for if you do draft Quinson Wright. If he's the leading guy in this room, no doubt, he's a, he's a pretty good value in drafts right now. Next one I'll be really quick on. Again, a little bit of uh, San Jose State news here comes to us from Inside the Spartans, another 247 site. If you haven't caught on yet, 247 sites are usually pretty solid at bringing you um, spring camp information if you know which ones to look for. Um, But this one will be quick. I'm not going to talk about quarterbacks and wide receivers. Both uh, positions sound like they're a ways away from being truly figured out, at least according to recent spring results. But... It is interesting to note from the Inside the Spartans page here that a lot of buzz has come for newcomer Floyd Chalk. Uh, The room is thin, quote, and he's taking the lead. So I'm not entirely sure what the value of a San Jose State wide or running back is going to be moving forward with... um, Craig Sutzman as the offensive coordinator because again at Conley only had about 875 yards at Utah Tech when he was the offensive coordinator there so maybe that's all we get out of Floyd Chalk but once again another guy that is free in drafts right now if you're at the end of your drafts you're struggling at running back and you're like oh god I don't even know if there's any starters left out there look up look up Floyd Chalk You're probably looking at the next San Jose State starting running back. I don't know what that ceiling is. I'm sure we're going to find out as it goes along here, but just something to know. Last but not least, let's talk about Cal here. Stick it on the West Coast here. A couple of wide receiver and QB updates. Let's talk about the quarterbacks. It's a little bit easier here. I've seen Chandler Rogers drafted in plenty of drafts, and I got to warn y'all that him and Mendoza are competing back and forth right now. And it currently sounds like based on reports that Mendoza 
has the upper hand compared to the two. And that makes sense, right? Like Mendoza is coming into his second year. He started a lot of games at Cal last year. I really think that Chandler Rogers leaving North Texas and going to Cal will end up being end up yeah, end up being one of the most regrettable transfers we deal with this offseason because he had it so good at North Texas. Now he's at Cal and he may not even start. So the other part of it is a kind of similar situation here is that the wide receivers have rotated quite a bit, but Tron Gazelle and Jordan King have been the two most consistent wide receivers. Once again, these are guys that were already at Cal. So maybe some of the guys behind them that transferred in have to work their way up still. But it is notable that Tobias Merriweather, a, a guy, Tobias especially, I have seen people draft quite a bit. And Mikey Matthews, another guy I've seen a couple people draft. They're mostly running with the twos right now. So I would say if you're going after a Cal wide receiver, I go with, I'd go with Gazelle. Again, a guy that had some flashes last year consistently with the ones right now has repertoire with Mendoza he's probably the guy that I would take the shot at I'd probably stay away from Tobias Merriweather and Mikey Matthews until we start getting some word that they've consistently moved up into the ones all right well with that just being my own solo show and everything getting us right at an hour is pretty good timing I would say so with nothing else to say I say with that, we've come to the end of our show. Thank you guys for listening. If you have not already, go ahead and leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're on the podcast side of things, follow the show and leave a five-star review where you can, whether that's on Spotify or whether that's on Apple Podcasts. Make sure you guys check out the rest of the Campus Again Podcast Network for any shows ranging on pretty much anything you can think of related to the college fantasy game. We'll see you guys back here next Monday on our regular schedule where hopefully we'll have some spring games that we'll have plenty to talk about there. Until then, really appreciate you guys, and I hope you guys have a wonderful and blessed week.